there's a lot of exaggerating. By the time a couple hundred years had passed and the martyrdom of St. Matthew was written, the number of innocents that Herod had allegedly killed was 3,000. By the time the Byzantine church in the east had a tradition of how many were killed, it had grown to 14,000, and the Syrian church, not to be outdone, their tradition reached 64,000, right? Is that the right kind of piety? Right? Um, there's also people who, partly because they hear about this sort of piety and they find a great tis- distaste for it, um, they look at that and they tend to go the other way. And they look at this event and they go, there's no way that happened. There's no way some king was just like, go to some town, kill everybody to and under. There's just no way that happened. In 2008, um, National Geographic did a, um, did a spread of a new archaeological dig at the Herodian, which is um, something just outside of Jerusalem. And in the article, they were talking about Herod, and they say Herod is mainly known for this, and this is what they said. They said Herod is best known for slaughtering every male infant in Bethlehem in the attempt to kill Jesus. He is almost certainly innocent of this crime. Right? Now, the funny thing about that is that um, it's also a ridiculous statement. It's as ridiculous as the Syrian tradition. One of the things I was thinking about today is one of the great um, advantages that skepticism has is that it has no true antonym. Do you notice that? One of the ways you attack something is to show that it's just like his opposite and both are ridiculous. And when a, when a word or a concept doesn't have a true opposite, it's hard to put it in its place. And so people think that the opposite of skepticism is faith, but it's not. The opposite of doubt is faith. Skepticism is the emotional determined, being emotionally determined not to believe something. Right? The, what's the opposite of that? Right? It's to be inordinately emotionally determined to believe something you shouldn't. Right? So I'm just going to make up a word because we need one. I'm going to call that believism, which is different from faith. Faith is maybe the opposite of doubt. We could work with that. It's not totally true. But the opposite of skepticism, we'll just call it believism. And believism is an unhelpful kind of faith. We, it's, it's so you think it's faith, you're trying to be pious, but it actually is a kind of way of believing that undermines real belief. Right? I mean, what, I mean how, many, how many children were killed? right? Was it 3,000? Was it 64,000? How bad was this, right? And the funny thing about this was is that the whole population of Bethlehem in 5 BC was about 300 people total. If you add in the less densely populated countryside, you might get another 200 people. That means we're talking about your average first grade or kindergarten classroom in a normal rural elementary school of somewhere between 20 and 30 kids. He, of course, he only killed boys, so you have to have that number. You're talking about 12 to 15, maybe 20 tops children. And um, that's not quite 3,000, right? And this kind of exaggeration is not found in the Bible. The Bible tells things kind of like, just like, just says them how they are, and You kind of sometimes wish it would say more, and you kind of sometimes wish it would be a little bigger. You know? It'd been great if Jesus had come out of the tomb, and there had been bleachers, you know? And there were like 15,000 people, including everybody in authority, and everybody who was disenfranchised, and everybody of opposite political parties, watched Jesus walk out of the tomb with like angels flanking him. I mean, like, that would have been awesome, right? To have a couple of women with some ointment find him not in the tomb. That's a little not as much as I was hoping for, right? But that's how the Bible is. That's how God is. He's understated. And so this kind of believism actually creates skepticism. Right? But the thing is, is that skepticism isn't any better. People flee that kind of believing, that kind of over-sentimentality, that sort of syrupy, everything's going to be wonderfulness, um, to skepticism, and they end up in just as bad a place. Right? You see, the— the scholars that say what that scholar in the National Geographic article says, that, that Herod almost certainly didn't kill the children, essentially hold this historical assessment equation in their mind. Lots of children were killed, right? We have a historical record in Josephus of Herod's wickedness. If he had killed a lot of children, it would have been in that record, and we would have heard about it outside the Bible. We didn't, so it didn't happen, right? Now, like, do you see how that's perfectly reasonable? 
It's perfectly reasonable. But it's the blindness of skepticism that causes people not to see it's totally wrong, right? Because when you do the math, you're actually talking about a few kids in a rural town. And here's the other thing. Most people don't realize what a nut job Herod was. Herod was like the most insane person in the ancient world. Like he was a very good statesman, and he built a lot of stuff. In fact, there was this thing done at um, Hebrew University a while back where they brought in a bunch of Herod historians and a bunch of psychotherapists. Okay? <laughs> I love academia sometimes. <laughs> And so the historians said everything they knew about Herod's behaviors and writings and so on. So they got as clear a historical picture of Herod as could. And then the, then the psychoanalysts psychoanalyzed Herod. Like, what was wrong with this guy? And they're like, narcissistic, schizophrenic, blah, blah, blah. But the, one of the things that they came up with, they were like, Herod had a psychological pattern. He would realize somebody was trying to kill him. He'd kill everybody associated with that. He'd fall into a depression. And he'd build his way out of it. Right? So he'd kill, you know, somebody, he'd kill them all, he'd feel kind of bad about it, and he'd, and he'd be like, oh. And then he'd build a city. In fact, Herod built more than almost anyone in the ancient world, partly because he killed so many people. You know? Um, killed three of his own sons. Killed his favorite wife out of ten. Massacred any, all numbers of proconsuls and aides and secretaries and so on who were associated. Just gutted everybody. In fact, he was so wicked, the Jews called him Herod the Wicked. He called himself Herod the Great. He realized on his deathbed that when he died, everybody was going to celebrate. And, and people don't really like that. You know, when they're going to die, people are going to celebrate. So here's what he did. He ordered on pain of death for all the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and throughout the countryside to assemble in the Hippodrome so that he could address them as their king. And it was on pain of death. If you didn't come, you were going to die. And so hundreds, I don't know if it was more than a thousand, but hundreds of Jewish leaders came and assembled in the Hippodrome right when Herod was supposed to die. And Herod issued the order that when he died, his soldiers would go in there and kill everyone so that there would be mourning in Israel when he died, right? And so then he died, and his sister, who was apparently half-sane, Salome, actually, the minute she, he died, she was in charge. She's like, don't do that. And so, and so all these fathers and husbands and grandfathers weren't killed. But they almost were. So crazy was Herod. Okay, and so now you go, okay, wait a second. If you're talking about 12 kids in a rural village— and you're talking about the life story of a guy that nuts. Of course you wouldn't have heard about it. Why would Josephus have written about it? He probably didn't even hear about it. Why would he? Right? But see, it only makes perfect sense when you step back and you go, okay, wait a second. And you just look at it with some clarity. And you don't allow yourself to be emotionally drawn in, either in a way that's syrupy, sentimentally positive. That's not really faith. It's like a believism. And you don't let yourself to draw in and be like, oh, this is terrible. How could he let that? I can't believe any of this. But if you just step back and you look at it, the historicity of it kind of makes sense. But the, the next question then is, but what about the theology of it? That's a much more important question, isn't it, in a way? Like, the nativity, isn't it a stinking mess? And this is the worst part. Poor girl loses her name. Poor guy's marriage didn't turn out the way he was expecting. You know, doesn't get to name his firstborn. They get sent off as refugees. A bunch of kids get killed. I mean, you know, I mean, couldn't God have made the star, like, go right to the manger instead of the Magi going to Herod and then going there? I mean, that seems like a fairly small astronomical shift that could have been done. Like, why— why is this like this? And this is really a question of what we call providence, right? Providence is God's rule. How God rules or administrates his rule in over all, crea all of creation. Does he do a good job or a bad job? Why does he do it the way he does it? Can we trust him given the way he does it? Right? Is it the nativity a providential mess? Or for some of us who don't really care about that, but have ourselves felt an experience of inexplicable loss or tragedy? You might think, well, Nick, I don't need to read this. I mean, I have experienced this. Yeah. So, so, but, but the, I think the question you have to ask, given what we just talked about in terms of the historicity, is, is it a providential mess? 
Or do we jump to a conclusion that everything's providentially fabulous or everything's providentially messed the same way we jump to conclusions about the historicity and other things? Do we just naturally, in an emotional way, thinking we're being really reasonable, just kind of jump to conclusions about, oh, this God couldn't possibly be doing it right? Or, without looking at it very carefully, oh, God certainly is doing it right. Right? The skeptic could look at this and say, you know, if God were good and in control, this kind of mess wouldn't happen. It's just that simple. Always be careful when people end sentences with it's just that simple, or it's this, it's obvious, or it's inevitable. Right? You're probably being duped. Or like the sort of believism, everything happens for a reason, and every, everything leads to happen, good things and happy endings. Right? One of the things I think we have to face when we look at something like the nativity, we see how messy it is, and we go, what the heck? And we look at our lives, and look at how God seems to be ruling the world we live in. I mean, there was a slaughter of the innocents a couple of weeks ago in Pakistan, right? People came and just killed 130 kids. Just, that happens all the time. Right? When we think about whether or not God is providentially ruling like he should— we are essentially estimating the meaning of reality, right? We're assuming we have enough of the facts to know, and we have a clear enough moral understanding of what's going on, and we're putting them together properly, okay? And if we—you just go back a couple minutes to that equation on whether or not Herod slaughtered the children. That first equation that more, more of the skeptical historians believe, and that looks pretty reasonable. And then it's totally not that fast. And the thing is, is that one of the, I, I put on Facebook this week, um, just a question. What, what kind of things are hard to estimate? That, what kind of things have you tried to estimate that you're bad at estimating? I got a bunch of answers back, right? What the weather's going to do, really, especially on your day off. How much pain somebody else is actually in. Um, how your priorities will change over the course of your life. Right, that's a pretty good one, right? I think that was my mom's. The tempting, the tempering temperature of chocolate without using a thermometer. That was kind of funny. It's like, oh, never thought of that one. How many dry spaghetti noodles does it take to feed this many people? <laughs> right? When will the UPS guy deliver our kids' presents so we can pretend that they aren't from us? Don't think about that one, kids. Um, the number of M&Ms or jelly beans in a jar, everybody's experienced that one. How long a home project will take, and how much more it will cost than I thought, and how fast my excitement for this project will dissipate. <laughs> a woman's age and weight, that was from a physical therapist that always has to ask. The toll parenting will take on an otherwise competent adult. <laughs> I won't reveal the person in the room who said that one. And how many people were at that event last night? I, one of the funny things that happens at staff, I, like, we, we had Stephanie while back. I was like, man, I was like, nobody at church on Sunday. And Jean's like, yeah, there were 50 more than usual. It's like, I just, I've just stopped estimating. But there's, I mean, there's something to learn from that in the sense of this. Think about this. These are real things we have trouble estimating. Okay? Now listen, I understand that you don't want to give up on thinking about the, the internal meaning of the universe and your ability to be angry at God too easily. But listen— if we can't guess jelly bean numbers, okay? Let's just hang with me here for just one second. I don't think I'm demagoguing. If we can't guess jelly bean numbers and dry spaghetti amounts, okay, do we really think our capacity to estimate the goodness and the efficacy and the competence of God's governance of the universe? Really? Um, th this is a quote from me, but I want to read it so that I don't talk around it for 15 minutes. H here's what I think I want to get across about this. We can't estimate these things accurately, and yet we seem to think we can try to estimate something infinitely more complex, what God is doing in the universe through his providence. Is this reliable reason or is it a less reliable impulse that seems reasonable? Maybe we need to have a much healthier doubt concerning our theological abilities of estimation rather than in God's purposes in his own providence, even in our inexplicable loss and tragedy. In that sense, I think this is really important to think about, especially in an age of skepticism, that 
what you put your doubt in is almost as important as what you say you put your faith in. What you put your doubt in is almost as important as what you put your faith in. If you immediately put your doubt in God and your faith in your ability to estimate what should happen in life's loss and tragedies, you will not believe in God. You will not trust him. You will not give your life to Jesus. You will not walk in step with the Spirit. You will not trust the Scripture. You just won't. If you put, and it didn't start with deciding you wouldn't put your faith in God. It started with what you wouldn't doubt, which was your own faculty of estimation. And see, the, the problem is, is that where we put our doubt is as, at, at least as important sometimes. Sometimes it's more important because you have to doubt something before you can believe what's true. Because the truth of the gospel is going to unseat something if you don't already believe it. If you really believe in something else, and the message of Christ comes in and says, hey, I should be there in the place of trust. Something is already in the place of trust, and you're going to have to doubt that enough to unseat it. Right? So, there are some hints as to why our thinking about God in relationship to, to tragedy and inexplicable loss a hint that we might be wrong. Just like that hint of like, you know, there were only 300 people in Bethlehem. That's a hint that it wasn't 3,000 kids, right? Similarly, there are hints in the Bible that, for example, when you take the death of a child, I mean, what's more inexplicably tragic than that? But there are some hints that there are things that God could say about that actually in the Bible. For example, in Isaiah 57, 1, it says, the righteous perish and nobody thinks about it, but the righteous many of the righteous were removed to save them from suffering. Meaning that God sometimes utilizes death to pull people out of something so they don't have to suffer through it any more than they already have. Right? You're not allowed to do that, but God is. And here's a hint. Your moral relationship to human death and God's moral relationship to human death are not the same. Right? Take, for example, um, I'll just comment quickly on Genesis 22. That's where God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, the one you love, and go and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. And Abraham goes to do it, and the story, as the story goes, he goes, right, gets ready to kill Isaac, and the angel intervenes and says, don't. Don't do it. And it says in the book of Hebrews, it says, when Abraham was reasoning through whether or not to do this, he also knew that in chapter 18 in Genesis, God had said that through Isaac, his offspring would go out and bless the entire world. So Isaac was going to have sons. Okay? God had told him to kill Isaac, and Isaac was going to have sons, and God said both of those. And it says in Hebrews that a the way Abraham put that together was, God can raise the dead. I'm going to kill Isaac, he's going to die, and then God's going to have to raise him from the dead. And you see— that's actually true. You see, because God's relationship to death is different than yours or mine. The reason I can't kill anyone is because I can't bring them back to life. Right? So if, if I killed someone, I couldn't bring them back to life. And there was another person here who could snap their fingers and somebody just died like this. And then right after they snapped their fingers and they just came right back to life. The killing that person did and the killing I did, we would not agree were morally the, had the same value right? Because, you know, if you just kind of think this through, it kind of makes sense, but there's a lot of people who go, wait a second, God can't do that. No, God can do anything he wants to. He can take away life from anyone at any time, whether or not they deserve it, because he can give it back at any time, however he wants, whether or not they deserve it. His relationship to death is totally different from yours. His right over your life is completely different than yours. You have less right over your own life than God does. I don't have more time for that. So the question then is, like, what is God doing then? Can we know anything? Are we just supposed to throw up our hands and go, well, we're, you know, we can't have, you know, we can't be believisms and we can't be skeptical. Like, what are we supposed to do? Just be, like, sort of, like, agnostic, do what you're told -ish sort of people? No, because the Bible does actually tell us a good bit about what God is doing so that we can know what we're supposed to do. It doesn't tell us so that we can tell God what he should do. The Bible just tells us enough about what God is doing so we can know what we're supposed to do. Right? Now, in terms of what God is doing, there's one thing that has to be really clear, is that the knowledge is very limited. I've said in a number of sermons over the last couple of months that God is the God who speaks and shows himself, but the God who very rarely explains himself. You got, we got to get that through our thick hearts. He's the God who speaks and shows himself. He tells us exactly what he wants us to know, and he shows us exactly what we need to see, and he does not explain himself on the basis of what we demand. But 
what he has spoken and shown about himself is at least three things, at least in this passage, about how he runs his providence. The one is, is that there is a judgment, and he allows for its confirmation in real life. Right? God has chosen to allow and confirm the choices of damnation. Damnation, and therefore eternal judgment, is so important in the flow of eternity that where we place ourselves and how we confirm our own destinies and what we choose and how God allows that confirmation is actually much more important to God than whether or not you get what you want. Because damnation is so terrible a thing, it has to be absolutely confirmed. It must be allowed. Because once it's allowed, it will never be disallowed. And so, Herod's confirmation of his own damnation was allowed. The second is, is that God has chosen to protect and establish his own way of redemption. He did that by saving the Christ child. For whatever else he's going to allow, whatever he's going to do, one thing he's going to do is his means and way of salvation is going to go forward. He's going to save. He's going to provide a savior, and that savior is king. In fact, John MacArthur said about all of Matthew 1 and 2, and the in all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled that are in the text of Matthew, he said, Matthew 1 and 2, the whole purpose of those two chapters is to simply demonstrate that Jesus is king. That Jesus is the saving king. And by lining those two things up, the, the, the damnation of judgment and God allowing for its confirmation and God's choice of salvation— to offer redemption to all people who would believe in the saving king that he provides, what he's essentially set up is a choice that he has chosen in his providence to allow to play out. In fact, it's in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13. There's this place where Jesus is telling a story about what the kingdom of God is like. That is God's administration of all of reality. He says, here's what the kingdom of God is like. He said, it's like a field where the farmers go out and they plant wheat. And the wheat starts to grow, but these other people come in and they plant weeds. And the weeds start to grow, and they both get up to a certain point, and the, the, the guy who owns the property comes in, and he's like, dude, you did not plant very good wheat. And the, and the farmers, the hands go, dude, we did not plant those weeds. He's like, but we'll weed it. And the, and the guy who owns the place goes, nope, can't do that now. You pull up the weeds, you're going to pull up the wheat. You've got to let this thing play out now. We'll let it grow, then we'll cut it down, and then we'll sort it out. You've got, you've got to let it happen. You can't, it's, it's the sort of thing you can't pull apart until the end. Jesus explicitly told us one of the reasons why God allows the providences he does. There is something about the nature of reality that in order to accomplish his end purposes, it cannot be pulled apart right now without killing everything. Without destroying his ultimate redemptive purpose. Which brings us to the point of the question, wait a second, in what sense does this passage teach about a redemptive king? Yeah, Jesus is the king, but where does it say in this passage that he'll be redemptive? Besides that his name will be Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. It's actually in the, in the quote from Jeremiah. The quote from Jeremiah 31 says this, This is what the Lord says, A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they're no more. Ramah is a place very close to Jerusalem. They're in the same region. And this is a quote from Jeremiah where the people of Israel had lost their right to stay in the land. Their rejection of God had brought disaster upon them. They had confirmed their own damnation. They'd played the Herod, basically. Which is interesting because the time where God finally came and judged his people and sent them in exile was when they started massacring their own children. It says that right in the Bible. And so God sends them in exile, right? And so Rachel is weeping for her children. They've been sent away into exile. They're gone. They're never to be seen again, right? And this is what happens when there is a rejection that creates this damnation, sort of disastrous loss, right? But the funny thing about this verse is if you actually look it up in the Old Testament, it's kind of a weird little verse. It's just kind of sitting there by itself. There's a new heading even in the Bible because it's kind of weird. And here's why it's weird. Because all of the verses before it in chapter 31 and all of the verses after it are a promise of redemption. I'd encourage you, go home tonight or tomorrow before you open presents, open Jeremiah 31 and read it. 
These are the only verses about damnation in the whole chapter. In fact, the very next verse says this. This is what the Lord says to those who were weeping because they had lost their children, because their children are the more, because, they, because ev- they've lost everything in inexplicable tragedy and loss. This is to those people, to Rachel weeping for her children. He says this. This is what the Lord said. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work will be, future tense, rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. That is, the thing that you lost in, in God's rule, in the messiness of it, as God providentially confirms damnation and produces redemption and calls people to a choice to reject self-kingship and to receive Christ's saving kingship. He says, there is all kinds of carnage created by that to which you will weep like Rachel losing all of her children into oblivion and exile. And this king comes along to fulfill chapter 31 of Jeremiah that says to those who have lost their children and who are weeping and lost and who have lost everything, restrain your voices from weeping because the time is coming when I will restore everything that was lost to you. When I cut down the wheat and the tares and I sort them out to the one who will trust in the returning king who brings redemption, I will bring back the ones that have been lost, all of them. And here these children stand for everything that Jesus would redeem. Jesus will redeem lost children. He will. That's one of the things he redeems. And lost children, because losing a child is one of the most painful possible things that can possibly happen, produces a meta- metaphorical how much more argument. And in, and in restoring the lost child, he will also at that restore all other things as well. Um, the cost of that was, though, the restoration of the lost children of Ramah was the cost of Christ, the King, God's Son. And it was intentional that you and I would reckon with that fact. That the cost of the redemption of our losses, as far as to the loss of children, which is a very real thing for many people, to the smallest slight that you think you didn't deserve. The restoration of those things for those who will participate in redemption rather than confirm their damnation in this providential moment of history. God wants us to understand that the cost of that king was the king that was God's son. And that should do something astounding to us. First, in repentance, but then in passionate love for the ruling one and a willingness to submit to and embrace how he is ruling in the present and a willingness to embrace that we want to be a maximal part of his redemptive purpose going forward so that the fewest people possible would confirm their damnation against the true king. I want to share with you a poem now written by John Piper um, where he puts these things together. Jake's wife would have been 58 the day that Jesus passed the gate of Bethlehem and slowly walked towards Jacob's inn. The people talked with friends and children played along the paths and Jesus hummed a song and smiled at every child he saw. He paused with one small lass to draw a camel in the dirt, then said, what's this? The girl bent down her head to study what the Lord had made. She smiled, a camel, sir, and laid her finger on the bulging back where merchants bind their leather pack. It's got a hump. Indeed it does. And who do you believe it was who made this camel with his hump? Without a thought that this would stump the rabbi guild and be reviled, she said, God did. And Jesus smiled. Good eyes, my child. And would that all Jerusalem within that wall of yonder stone would see the signs of peace. He left the lass 
with lines of simple wonder in her face and slowly went to find the place where he was born. Folks said the inn had never been a place for sin, for Jacob was a holy man, and he and Rachel had a plan to marry, have a child or two, and serve the folks who traveled through, especially the poor, who brought their meal and turtle doves and sought a place to stay near Zion's gate. They'd rise up early, stay up late to help the pilgrims go and come. And when the place was full, to some, especially the poorest, they would say, we're sorry there's no room, but stay now if you like out back. There's lots of hay and we have extra cots that you can use. There'll be no charge. The stable isn't very large, but Noah keeps it safe. He was a wedding gift to Jake because the shepherds knew he loved the dog. There's nothing in the Decalogue, he used to joke, that says a man can't love a dog. The children ran ahead of Jesus as he strode towards Jacob's inn. The stony road that led up to the inn was deep with centuries of wear and steep at one point just before the door. The Lord knocked once, then twice, before he heard an old man's voice, round back, it called. So Jesus took the track that led around the inn. The old man leaned back in his chair and told the dog to never mind and had no one to tend the door, my lad, for 30 years. I'm sorry for the inconvenience to your sore feet. The road to Jerusalem is hard, ain't it? Don't mind old Shem, he's harmless, like his dad. Won't bite a Roman soldier in the night. Sit down. Jacob waved the stump of his right arm. We're in a slump right now. I've got lots of time to think and talk. Come, sit, have a drink. From Jacob's well, he laughed. You own the inn? The Lord inquired. On loan, you'd better say. God owns the inn. At that, the Lord knew they were kin and ventured on. Do you recall the tax when Caesar said to all the world that each must be enrolled? Old Jacob winced. Are north winds cold? Are deserts dry? Do fishes swim and ravens fly? I do. A grim and awful year it was for me when God ordained that strange decree. How could I such a time forget? Why do you ask? I have a debt to pay, and I must see how much. Why do you say that it was such a grim and awful year? He raised the stump of his right arm. So dazed, young man, I didn't know I'd lost my arm. Do you know what it costs for me to house the Son of God? The old man took his cedar rod and swept it round the place, empty, for 30 years alone, you see? Old Jacob, poor old Jacob, runs it with one arm, a dog, no sons. But I had sons once. Joseph was my firstborn. He was small because his mother was so sick. When he turned three, the Lord was good to me and Rachel and our baby Ben was born the very fortnight when the blessed family arrived. And Rachel's gracious heart contrived a way for them to stay there in that very stall. The man was thin and tired. You look a lot like him. But Jesus said, why was it grim? We got a reputation here that night. Nothing at all to fear in that, we thought. It was of God. 
but in one year the slaughter squad from Herod came. And where do you suppose they started? Not a clue. We didn't have a clue what they had come to do. No time to pray, no time to run, no time to get poor Joseph off the street and let him say goodbye to Ben or me or Rachel. Only time to see a lifted spear smash through his spine and chest. He stumbled to the sign that welcomed strangers to the place and looked with panic at my face as if to ask what he had done. No man, you ever lost a son? The tears streamed down the Savior's cheek. He shook his head, but couldn't speak. Before I found the breath to scream, I heard the words, a horrid dream. Kill every child who's two or less. Spare not for aught, nor make excess. Let this one be the oldest here. And if you count your own life, dear, let none escape. I had no sword, no weapons in my house. But Lord, I had my hands, and I would save the son of my right hand. So brave. Rachel was so brave. Her hands were like a thousand iron bands around the boy. She wouldn't let him go. And so her own back met with every thrust and blow. I lost my arm, my wife, my sons, the cost of housing the Messiah here. Why would he simply disappear? and never come to help. They sat in silence, and Jacob wondered at the stranger's tears. I am the boy. I am the boy that Herod wanted to destroy. You gave my parents room to give me life. And then God let me live and took your wife. Ask me not why the one should live, another die. God's ways are high, and you will know in time. But I have come to show you what the Lord prepared the night you made a place for heaven's light. In two weeks, they will crucify my flesh. But mark this, Jacob. I will rise in three days from the dead and place my foot upon the head of him who has the power of death. And I will raise with life and breath your wife and Ben and Joseph too and give them Jacob back to you with everything the world can store and you will reign forevermore.